Our first song tonight is number 391. If you would please stand. Number 391. <clears throat> in thy field I would yield sickles brave and true. In the fight for the right I would dare and do. Spend my days in thy praise all the journey through. Let me live close to thee. Let me live close to Thee. Guide me all along the way. Let me live close to Thee. Let me walk close to Thee each day. Not a crown or renown, that's a word. See, I would work, never shirk, blessed Lord, for Thee. But to know where I go, that my soul is free, let me live close to Thee each day. Let me live close to Thee, guide me all along the way. Let me live close to Thee. Let me walk close to Thee each day. Help me bear and to share some poor pilgrim's load. Be my friend to the end of the toilsome road. I would sing to my King in the soul's abode. Let me live close to Thee each day. Let me live close to Thee. Guide me all along the way. Let me live close close to thee each day. Please be seated. <clears throat> Next song will be number 660. Number 660. And after this, we'll have our scripture reading and prayer. <clears throat> there is a habitation built by the I love 
is 1 Timothy 6, 8 through 12, and this from the King James Version. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and to many foolish and hurtful lust, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Fight the good fight of faith, lay hold on to eternal life, whereunto thou art called, and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Let's pray. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day that you have blessed us with. We thank you for the blessing of the sunshine today, Father, that we could all enjoy. And we thank you for the opportunity that we have to be here tonight and to worship you and study your word, Father. And please help us as we go into this lesson that we can take and absorb the things that we hear, Father, and to truly apply them to our lives to make ourselves better in the future than we have been in the past. Please be with all those that need our prayers. We know there are many who are sick and who are struggling in this world, Father. And please just be with us and help us to help them in any way that we possibly can. Thank you for the great many blessings you bless us with, both physical and spiritual. Please keep us as we go through the rest of this worship. It's in your son Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. For our lesson, we'll sing number 523. Number 523. <clears throat> In Him we live. 
Indeed, tonight we serve the God that is alive, the God that is great. What an honor and a privilege it is to do so tonight in this period of worship. Thank you for joining us. Thank you to each one that tunes in online or listens to our conference call. We're happy that we can provide that opportunity for you to participate with us this evening as well. Fourth Sunday night, it's question and answer time. And just thinking about the greatness of God and the quest of a lifetime, trying to understand Him and His life uh, and His existence, His nature, uh, everything about Him uh, is something that uh, never, uh, never grows uh, dull. It's a never tiresome task uh, to me. And I'm thankful for the time that I've uh, been allowed to study and to contemplate such things and pray that uh, the Lord will yet permit more time. And the best thing is uh, eternity uh, will be ours to spend with our God and how He chooses to disclose Himself, whether fully or uh, otherwise. Uh, that will be something I guess we'll only know when we get there. I think it will be a full disclosure of God. We cannot certainly understand or expect or even uh, be able to fully uh, appreciate that if he were to do so in this life it would be too overwhelming in the physical but then uh, perhaps as scripture says we will see him face to face there's a lot uh, in that so all of these questions that we have if he chooses to answer them then uh, then we'll let him do that and if not uh, then we'll just uh, be happy in his presence so let's jump right into it uh, tonight here are the questions that are submitted and uh, feel free to submit one yourself you can email that you can print it out uh, write it down, send it to Sonia, put it in the little box uh, out back, however you want to do that. Uh, most of these, I think, actually this month came in by email, and so that's okay uh, as well. Question asked, number one, what defense would you give for the gap theory? Some of you know what is meant by the gap theory, but uh, what defense would you give for it? Let me briefly just try to uh, explain what we're talking about. You can turn all the way back to Genesis chapter 1, and uh, this theory really uh, had its start... Roughly 200, 300 years ago, there were some uh, maybe ideas about it previous to that. But as science began to advance and uh, as people began to shift uh, their thinking, unfortunately, away from faith in God to more what they would consider materialistic explanations uh, for our origin and for our universe, uh, there were some that still wanted to hold on to what the Bible taught. And so uh, they would begin to say, instead of what Genesis describes as a week of creative activity in six days, God creating the world, uh, maybe there was a gap in between uh, some of that time. For instance, uh, maybe there was a gap between each day. And so on the first day, God said, let there be light. And maybe because it looks or it appears to some who study the evidence that there are many, many millions of years between uh, where we live now and events of the past in the archaeological record and uh, in the uh, geography of the world and things of that nature. Uh, maybe there's a gap between the days. And here uh, Moses was just writing kind of symbolically to say one thing happened and then another and another. And he just condensed it into a six-day period uh, just to give us you know, a, a simple understanding of the story. Uh, others, uh, that uh, view was quickly uh, dismissed. And the reason why was Exodus 20 verse 11. If you read what there Moses said, In six days you shall work. Because in six days God created the earth, rested on the seventh. And so uh, that position kind of fell out of favor. The other idea is uh, that the gap theory suggests that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then in verse 2, uh, the idea is that God reformed. Uh, some of the creation that he had made and perhaps that original creation did happen in the beginning millions or billions of years ago and there's a lot of things that kind of intersect with that a big bang theory for some evolutionary uh, theory would fall into this category but then God started over and when man arrived on the scene, which according to uh, humanistic and atheistic scientists uh, were relatively new to the planet, uh, according to their methodology and worldview, then uh, perhaps here we just have the record of that event forward. Uh, but really, both ideas are untenable with good science. And notice what I'm saying, good science. For First, the idea that there are gaps between each day can not only uh, be dismissed because Moses said, work six days and rest on the seventh. 
He didn't say rest for uh, the seventh day after working for six million years, a million years in between each day. That wouldn't be possible. Further, uh, as God said, well, first there's light, and then there's dry land, and then there's uh, the plant life and the animal life. A great space of time would not allow those different organisms uh, to arise as they have, so that's dismissed. Uh, further, the idea that there is some expansive amount of time uh, and that the earth had some sort of reforming uh, after that expansive period of time, likewise, cannot be sustained. What did they do? Well, those that again wanted to try to make friends with the scientists who wanted to dismiss the Bible, uh, they tried to go to some Hebrew linguist and try to fit it in there. That's really what they did. And uh, so here, if this makes sense to you, you know much more about the gap theory than I do. You can argue over bara. It's a Hebrew word that means to create from nothing. And that's what God did in verse 1. God created. Uh, we only use that term uh, in a very human way. We say we created. We create nothing in the same sense that God does. My wife created a delicious uh, dinner for us. You mean she formed it out of nothing? Well, no, of course not, preacher. Uh, she took different ingredients and with her skill and expertise, she combined them. And with different methods of cooking, she uh, made a beautiful uh, dish with dessert and all of the trimmings and I enjoyed it. Well, she formed out of previous existing elements or ingredients, uh, those things. And with her skill, she combined them to provide a good meal for you. She did not do as God did. He created out of nothing. Hebrews 11 verse 3, the Hebrew writer says, By faith we understand understand that the worlds were made out of what? Nothing. Uh, just simply the Word of God was spoken and it came to pass. And you read that beginning in verse 3 and onward. Uh, the word there, Hebrew word for hasah, is a, another word that shows up in verse 2. I won't bore you with the details. Does it have the idea of reforming there uh, when it talks about the earth being without form and God was going to reform it? Uh, I don't see a very compelling case for that. Uh, again, if you know uh, what this is speaking of, you can understand it better than I can. I can only kind of tiptoe around the edges. You can talk about the disjunctive uh, little consonants there in Hebrew. The wa is it disjunctive or parenthetical. If you want to know more about that, look up um, Dr. Justin Rogers' article about this at Apologetics Press, and he'll give you all of the Hebrew about it. So what's the defense for the gap theory? There is none. What God did is exactly what Scripture says He did. And by faith we believe that the evening and the morning, and the evening and the morning, and the evening and the morning, in six days God created the heavens and the earth and rested on the seventh. Does it take faith to believe that? Yes. Why? Because none of us were there to observe it with our own eyes. Does that mean that there's no evidence for it? Absolutely not. In fact, if we had time and each of these questions could really be turned into an entire lesson itself, I could argue, I think, very persuasively. For me, it would take more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a child of God and to believe what the Bible simply says occurred in the way it says it occurred. So is there a defense for the gap theory? There is not. More uh, clarification if on any of these questions you want, feel free to ask. Question number two, what does it mean to worship in spirit? Now, uh, you see by the use of this image, I'm purposefully trying to maybe plan an idea in your mind. When some people hear that term worship in spirit, uh, they automatically have the, this idea that perhaps it involves more bodily movements. Uh, it might involve even a certain kind of mood as it relates to the lighting or the environment uh, that worship takes place in. Of course, if you want to turn to John chapter 4, you might say, well, worship in spirit, is that something we should do? Well, absolutely. It's not just something we should do, it's something we must do. When Jesus was speaking uh, to that Samaritan woman, you remember he inquired about her personal life, and her personal life was such a mess she turned the conversation to religion. Now you know you've got a problem when that happens, uh, but that's what she did. And uh, Jesus said, yes, you Samaritans, Mount Gerizim, that's where you like to worship. Uh, the Jews worship in Jerusalem, but Jesus, kind of with just a dismissal of both, woman, the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father is seeking such to worship Him, and then for emphasis, God is spirit. This is John 4, 24. Jesus speaking, God is spirit and those who worship him must. M-U-S-T. It's essential. It's an in, uh, it's no, no room for debate. It's incapable uh, of being done any other way. Pleasing worship to God must be offered with the components of spirit 
and truth. We must worship Him in spirit and truth. Now, this presents us with a unique dilemma. Worshiping in spirit uh, is something that we're talking about, but allow me first to think about this with you. When it says we worship in truth, that's an observable reality. It's something we can verify. Truth, well, uh, maybe the follow-up question some would ask is, how do we know what truth is? John 17, verse 17, this same gospel, Jesus is praying and He prays to the Father and He said uh, that it would be His wish that the Father would sanctify His followers, the apostles, by extension even us tonight, in truth. And then He adds, just so we would be uh, able to easily identify, sanctify them through Thy Word, and it is Thy Word that is truth. So the Word of God is the truth. It's our standard. It's the criteria that we must meet. That's observable. That's something we can verify. In other words, we can read in here what God has told us to do. And I can watch you and you can watch me and we can observe each other and we can say, okay, that meets the standard of truth. And again, each act of worship, we could go step by step, one, two, three, four, five, and notice those. We could talk about when we pray. Well, are we praying uh, in the way that the New Testament authorizes and instructs us to do? Okay, we could check that off. Uh, are we observing each Lord's Day, the first day of the week, uh, the Lord's Supper, remembering His body and His blood and the unleavened bread and fruit of the vine? Okay, I've watched you do that. You've watched me do that. And each of the other acts could likewise be so verified. However... Worshiping in spirit is not subject to that sort of objective verification. Now, sometimes I do this, and uh, maybe I shouldn't, but uh, sometimes I just look around, especially while we're singing. And uh, sometimes that's from the front, sometimes that's at the conclusion of the service when we're uh, done. Our song leaders, if they wanted to be brutally honest, uh, they could tell you that they notice this even more than I do. And what do they see? Well, perhaps they notice far too often uh, maybe that some are not participating. So maybe they would say that truth, their criteria was not met. But even when it is, and even right now as you are listening, my verification of you worshiping in spirit is not possible. I can't tell that. Uh, you can't tell that about the person sitting next to you. The only person that knows whether or not you are worshiping in spirit is you. God the Father, of course, knows. Uh, it's not... Um, it's not beyond His ability to easily observe. Uh, but us, all of us, each of us, inwardly and individually must worship in spirit. Well, what does that mean? If that's not objectively verifiable, it's something that we must give attention to. Uh, there's a passage in the book of Joshua that some people think Jesus is uh, quoting. And Jesus didn't have to quote from Joshua 24. Uh, even if He does or did, it doesn't lessen the impact of His words. Uh, but Joshua said long ago to the children of Israel, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity... And in truth, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And Jesus, even if he's quoting this same passage, is stating a truth just like Joshua was, was stating it. It had been true long before Joshua said it. It was true in the time of our Lord and it will be true time without end. God wants us to worship Him. And if we do, spirit and in truth, or as Joshua says in the Hebrew there, sincerely, wholeheartedly. Uh, it's something that involves the totality of our person. Now, sometimes when people say, well, worship in spirit, it's about your attitude or your disposition. And we dismiss that. And what we have done, and uh, this is just my analysis of the situation, because we have seen and observed in the religious world a tendency uh, for people to let their feelings get out of control, uh, we have said worshiping in spirit has nothing to do with how you feel. I would challenge that tonight, and I would challenge it on this basis. What is your attitude except for the relation of your thinking to how you're feeling? Isn't that what our attitude is? If I feel happy, it's about how I'm feeling. It's my thought about feeling as I feel. If I feel sad, likewise the same way. Now, we have to certainly uh, be cautious. And are we, uh, am I suggesting, you might say, uh, that our feelings can just go anywhere we want them to go? Uh, can we be unbridled, if you will, and unrestrained in our uh, worship? Uh, that's not what I'm suggesting at all. I am suggesting, though, that both our attitude and our feelings, when informed by truth. Now notice, Jesus said, worship in spirit 
and truth. Uh, it would be pneuma kai aletheia in Greek. And that little conjunction, kai, K-A-I, it would look, if we gave it English characters, is a conjunction. It's a set of handcuffs, if you will. Jesus said, you cannot worship properly if you do not worship in spirit and truth. If you take away truth and just worship in spirit... Not proper worship. If you take away spirit and just worship in truth, it's not proper worship. If you want to worship God in the way that He is pleased uh, with the worship you offer, you must worship Him, worship Him acceptably, utilizing both spirit and truth. What does spirit mean? Well, it involves my disposition, my attitude, and yes, my feelings based on how I'm feeling, my attitude toward that. Now, what is that attitude of in spirit or what does that include uh, here would be what i would tell you and maybe you could no doubt add to this list of what it means to worship in spirit it's an attitude it's a mindset it's a demeanor that i worship humbly i worship humbly and sometimes even that uh, might ex itself be expressed um, i don't know i don't recall ever having seen it done in my time here over the last three years, but some of you uh, have observed this. You remember when some of the older gentlemen that would lead the congregation in prayer would come to the front and they would get down on one knee to pray. Now, we've not done that. And there's a good reason why, very practically, we have an amplification system, the uh, size of this building so that everyone can hear. The microphone is utilized. Uh, those leading in prayer stand here and further as it goes out by technology to those watching and listening. That's what we've done. But growing up in a country church, you would sometimes see a man come to the front and he would kneel down. Why? Was he saying, hey, everybody look at me. I'm going to show you how holy I am. No, I don't think that was the intent of those men whatsoever. It was to say, I'm bowing before the Almighty God. I'm going to be humble. I'm going to be reverent uh, and respectful. Uh, again, this attitude, it's not a showy one. Uh, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, uh, you remember what Paul said. He would that men pray everywhere, lifting holy hands. And you've probably seen that very uh, expression utilized in worship uh, in some capacity. You might have uh, been at uh, some location where some sort of worship was offered and that was done. Uh, interestingly enough, I saw it more than anywhere else at the funeral home. There would be people uh, during the singing of a religious song uh, who would sway back and forth and wave their hands. Uh, Paul said to lift holy hands when prayer is offered. The Jewish typical way of praying was to pray with the palms out uh, or the palms up and the hands out extended like that. Is that something we must do? No, again, uh, but is it a, certainly an attitude of spirit giving maybe an expression in the way that we act? Maybe. Uh, certainly worshiping in our uh, spirit, in a proper spirit, uh, would mean that we would express joy or gladness. The psalmist said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I guess what I'm telling you about all of these things, my heart, my soul, all of our being involved in worshiping in spirit and in truth, uh, we have maybe as a reaction to those who have been overexpressive in their worship, felt like that we could make no expression at all. If we get too excited in worship, what will people think of us? If I sing too loud, everybody will turn and look at me. Uh, if I really participate in the sermon and uh, tell the preacher, amen, he may go all night. You know, that sort of thing, we're maybe a little bit afraid of that. Uh, but you read the book of Psalms, and you will read that collection of hymns and worship poetry offered to God, and you'll hear expressions like, Shout to the Lord, all the earth. And we're told as the pilgrims would enter Jerusalem, they would sing the Hallel Psalms, as they were called. Hallel, uh, from which we get the word hallelujah, praise to God. And they would not do it muted. They would not do it with a downcast look. They would not do it with a sad face. They would do it joyfully. And so, what about our worship? Now you may say, well, this is different. I wonder, and I wonder like you do, because I've seen my own reactions, both through my own eyes and through those who have told me, when I'm excited in other settings, when I'm happy in other places. If I'm watching a certain team that has the right color on, beating the other colored team that I don't like, I can be really happy about that. What should cause me greater joy than to come into the presence of my God and worship Him? Should I do it in truth? Yes. Must I do it uh, with the prescribed uh, ways in which He has given? Absolutely. Am I free to deviate therefrom? No, not at all. But worshiping in spirit on, if you will, that spiritual wavelength uh, that it involves my total person. Will it affect how I feel? I think it will. Will it affect even my expression? Maybe so. 
And uh, it deserves more, as I said, thought and consideration. And I hope you know both what I am saying and what I'm not. If that's been unclear, feel free uh, to ask me and I'll, again, try to provide a further clarification. But worship in spirit and truth. Uh, we like to emphasize truth. We like to tell people especially, you must worship in truth. Don't neglect that Jesus said spirit is just as important. Question three tonight. When did the church slash kingdom begin? And then the questioner followed up with this uh, series of questions. Was it when Jesus died on the cross, the Old Testament fulfilled, when Jesus was re resurrected and his identity confirmed, or when he ascended back to heaven and he began his rule at the Father's right hand in glory? That's an excellent question, and I'll admit to you, I never thought of it in that set of terms and with those follow-up questions. And what I would tell you is all of those events were indispensable. The death of Jesus was essential because, in fact, as the questioner noted, the Old Testament was fulfilled. There is coming one who will be the perfect sacrifice. And we know those other attached prophecies. And Jesus did it. Yes, it was when he was resurrected. Had he not been, he would just have been like all other men. But he said he was the Son of God and he proved it when his tomb was empty three days later. And yes, it was when he ascended to the Father's right hand. Because there at the Father's right hand, he is given a position of authority. And he reigns now there forever. Uh, is that though, which of those are when the kingdom actually had its beginning? Well, let's dig into that a little further. As I said, all of those are essential, but I think they're building towards something else. In uh, Matthew 16 and verse 28, Jesus made a promise, and that same promise is repeated in Mark 9, 1 and Luke 9, 27, and it's this. Mark 9, 1 says, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to some of you, or to those of you uh, that are standing here, you will not taste death until you see the kingdom of God come with power. Now that's the promise he made. Those people were there listening and Jesus said, I'm telling you the truth. No doubt about it. I'm telling you the truth. Some of you standing here will not taste death till you see the kingdom of God come with power. And so uh, that only leaves us with a couple of options to do with this statement of Jesus. Number one, there are some really old folks, right? If Jesus said, uh, they would not taste death. If the kingdom has not come, there's some really old folks somewhere on the planet tonight, in excess of 2,000 years old now. Now, why is that silly? Uh, because there are those of a millennial persuasion or background that says Jesus didn't establish a kingdom. He wanted to, but he failed. So he established the church instead. Well, Jesus uh, then uh, must mean that there's some really old folks alive tonight. Or number two, he's a liar. Uh, that's what the uh, millennial position would be forced to admit because Jesus said, I will uh, establish my kingdom. You will see it. And so if they're not alive, if those people have already died, then Jesus did not tell the truth on this occasion. What kind of Savior would He be? Uh, what if His identity as the Son of God? Well, all of that goes up in the proverbial smoke, if you will. Or number three, what Jesus said would happen did in fact happen. And that's, in fact, exactly what did happen. Matthew 16, verse 19, another verse that we could stack on top of this. Jesus, after telling Peter, based on his confession that he was the Christ, the Son of the living God, he said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. You remember that statement? We wonder what that means. Hold that thought and we'll come back to it. There were Old Testament promises about this kingdom. In Daniel 2, 44, historically, Daniel lays out a timeline of history. And if you follow his timeline, which time will not permit us to do that tonight, you will see that during the rule of the Roman Empire, Daniel said the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed. He pictured it like a stone cut out of the mountain without hands. And Jesus uh, would certainly piggyback on that idea, telling Peter, again, this kingdom is coming. Daniel said it was coming. It would come during this historical time period. Isaiah 2, verse 2 and 3 said in the a mountain of the Lord's house, that is, in the city of Jerusalem, the law would go forth. And I'm summarizing these. Most of you know them, I think. Uh, but there's so much more that we could look at. Now again, what we've got here is we've got to ask ourselves, uh, especially about ideas to the contrary. If the kingdom was not established, or when it was established, we're trying to ask that same question. If millennialism is right, whether premillennialism, dispensational premillennialism, or postmillennialism, if you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. They would say Jesus came to establish the kingdom and he failed. That's what they say. He wanted to establish the kingdom, Jews wouldn't let him. He's coming again, though he'll reign for a thousand years, that's the usual explanation, and then he'll do it. 
Well, my question is, if he didn't do it the first time, how do we have any assurance he could do it the second time? Of course, he did not fail the first time. Uh, there's been a renewed interest, uh, actually even among some of our brethren, with an idea that's called realized eschatology. And it really says in a nutshell that in A.D. 70, when Jerusalem was uh, destroyed, Jesus came again. You didn't know that, did you? But they say He came again. All of the prophecies that the New Testament makes were already fulfilled. And what we do from here really is anybody's guess. And you can't really pin them to the wall on any of this. It's a silly idea too, uh, because time still stands. Others say the transfiguration that Jesus would experience later in Mark chapter 9, later in Matthew 17. That's what He meant. That these people would see the kingdom of God come with power. But that doesn't make any sense because that was Moses and Elijah appearing to Jesus and Jesus Himself was told He was not yet even in the kingdom, but it was coming. He would accomplish His decease at Jerusalem. And so what do we see? Um, very quickly tonight, if you turn to Acts chapter 2, what you will see as that chapter opens is the Holy Spirit sent from heaven to these men that Jesus had told His apostles to remain in Jerusalem. And there the Holy Spirit gave them the power to speak in tongues. And they stood up and preached the gospel for the very first time. And the doors of the kingdom, if you will, if you will were open. And everything in the Bible revolves around this hub in chapter 2 of the book of Acts. Everything prior to it points to it as saying the kingdom is coming, the kingdom is coming. What's interesting, again, if we had time, we could look at this in much greater detail. Everything after Acts chapter 2 tells us the kingdom had arrived. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13. Paul said of those Colossians, they had been translated into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Uh, John, while exiled in uh, Patmos in the book of Revelation, said that he was in the kingdom on the Lord's day. What do those people do with verses like that? Well, they just ignore them. When did the kingdom begin? When did the church start? Combining the Old Testament prophecies, combining the words of Jesus, uh, combining all of these indications and clues, if you will, and even the words of Peter himself when he stood up to preach from Joel chapter 2, following the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus and the announcement of the gospel, it began on the day of Pentecost. And that church, that kingdom is now uh, also, of course, the church that we can be a part of that belongs to the Dear Son of God, anything else we don't need to be a part of. I'll just say it as simply as that. Jesus said He would build His church and He did. He said His kingdom would come and it did. And it's in existence tonight and the Hebrew writer says we have this kingdom and it cannot be shaken. It's not subject to the attacks of men, to the futility of time. It's not something that's going to pass away. We can hold fast to it. We can rejoice that we are a part of it and citizens therein. We could go on and on. Time will not permit, but uh, that's a good uh, study, hopefully, of when the church, when the kingdom began. Here's question three. Is it a sin to be discouraged? Does being discouraged mean I'm showing a lack of faith? Is it possible to respond to the invitation and ask for encouragement and strength without necessarily having any particular sin? To confess. You see the connection of each of these, so let's take them one by one. Is it a sin to be discouraged? I sure hope not. If it is, I'm much worse sinner than I first believed. Uh, here's the way I would answer that. Was Jesus discouraged? Well, you never read verbatim, Jesus was discouraged. I'll grant that. However, I believe that there are certainly times in our Savior's life when because He was in the flesh, that that is exactly the emotion that He must have experienced. Here's but one proof. In John chapter 6, Jesus has had controversy and argument with the Jews who would not reject Him, even though He gave them an abundance of evidence. And Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. You need Me. I will sustain you. And the Bible says that, sadly, many... Many, this is John 6, 66, of His disciples, who are the disciples, followers of His, many of His disciples went back and walked with Him no more. They followed Him when they got a free meal. Now He's demanding a commitment. They're not willing to make it. So they give up. Now, you're not Jesus and neither am I, but you've done something in life that you wanted recognition for. You wanted to try to help people and you've been spurned. You've tried to give them what is in their best interest, a course of action, and they've rejected it. All of us have had that. How did you feel? 
You were discouraged. Can you imagine being the Son of God? Yes, in the flesh, knowing what was best for these people and offering them eternal life only to have them turn away, to walk away and reject it? Look at verse 67. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? John doesn't give us any indication of the facial expression Jesus used on this occasion. I don't know what his facial expression was like. I don't know the tone of voice that he used. Could he have said it angrily? Perhaps. But I tend to believe, just knowing my human nature and you knowing your human nature, trying to put myself in his sandals, I think probably with a dejected, maybe even downcast countenance, Jesus may be even shaking his head. Do you, do you also want to go away? Is there anybody that's going to believe me? Is there anyone that's going to take advantage of my offer of eternal life? Don't you believe that Jesus here asked the question with a tinge of discouragement? I think that He did. Even if you dismiss that one in John 13, 21, or if you dismiss this one in John 6, 67, go to John 13, 21. Now the cross is just ahead. Jesus knew it. He has already washed the feet of these ungrateful men. But worse than that, in verse 21, Jesus says, one of you is going to betray me. And He made sure that they understood as best they could, even though they still seem to be blind and um, unaware of it. When Jesus had said these things, notice John adds, He was troubled in spirit. How did John know that? Well, you might say He's writing the inspiration. That's how He knew that, yes. But He's an eyewitness to these events. You've seen someone and you just know by the look on their face and you say, what's wrong? What's bothering you? You're able to do that. You could do that with your spouse. You could do that with your children, with your good friends. What's wrong? I can see it on your face. John, as an eyewitness, could see it on the face of Jesus. He was troubled in his spirit. And then he repeats again, Most assuredly I say to you, one of you will betray me. Was Jesus discouraged? I think on these two occasions as well as others, he most certainly was. Further, I would contend according to Hebrews 2.18 and Hebrews 4.15 because he had to be tempted in all points like as we are, experience the full range of human emotions, it was necessary for him to be discouraged. Now, that presents us our follow-up question. Is a lack of faith a sin? Matthew 6.30, 8.26, 14.31, and 16.8, Jesus reproves his apostles on all four occasions saying, Oh, you of little faith. Why do you have little faith? Why don't you take care of your faith and realize that God takes care of you like the birds and the flowers, Matthew 6.30. Uh, Peter, what are you worried about? You're walking on water. You should trust me, but you sunk. Why don't you uh, think about taking bread? You don't have bread? Don't you remember what I just did? I can turn uh, five loaves of bread into enough to feed 5,000. Each time he said, oh, you of little faith. Neither of these four occasions or any other time did Jesus condemn a lack of faith as sin. Was it immaturity? Yes. Uh, was it a lack of trust? Perhaps. But was it sin and violation of the will of God? It doesn't seem so. Now, can one respond to the invitation? Uh, let me just say this, and this kind of deserves maybe another uh, lesson itself as well. There is no invitation protocol in the New Testament. That's what I'm calling it. You will search the New Testament in vain to find a time when Peter or Paul or James or John or Jesus uh, concluded one of their sermons by saying, come as we stand and sing. It just isn't in there. What we have is a tradition. Uh, there is no divine authority mandating any specific. We know that we are to confess our faults one to another. James 5, 16. We are told that if we suffer, we should pray and ask others to pray for us. We know 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our faults, He's faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So this is a time when we can do that. Can we do that during this time of invitation? Yes. Maybe this preacher doesn't do a sufficient job in maybe explaining that or uh, giving, I won't say permission, you don't have to have my permission, but just to let people be aware. Can you come and say to your Christian family, I'm in a tough spot, I'm having struggles. Yes, you can, and maybe all of us. I won't even say maybe. I know with certainty all of us should do that, maybe even more than we do. So is it a sin to be discouraged? No. Is it a lack of faith? Uh, perhaps, but that doesn't make it a sin. Uh, can we ask others to help us when we're discouraged by prayer and otherwise? Yes, we should, and yes, I think we must. Question number four. 
Why is it considered humane and loving to euthanize an animal in serious pain or a debilitating disease, etc., but deemed immoral concerning a human being? This little puppy dog looks sad, and I'm not trying to play on your emotions tonight. Animals are special. They are beloved, but they are not made in the image of God. They do not possess immortal souls. The influence of evolutionary teaching has muddled the thinking of many on this particular idea. So why would we say that an animal uh, might could be put down? That's the terminology that I've heard most often. And uh, that would not be suitable for a human. One's made in God's image and the other is not. The same questioner followed that up then, of course, with this question. What about end-of-life decisions, both by the individual and also their loved ones, such as life-saving measures to prolong one's life, continuation of artificial food and hydration, etc.? Um, this is a tough subject. I'll just go ahead and tell you in advance. I've dealt with it a lot, given my background, as you might imagine. Uh, give me about uh, five to seven minutes, and I'll do my best to condense it. If you want more, I'll be happy to give it to you later. What we're talking about is commonly put under the heading of the term euthanasia. It can also be considered physician-assisted suicide. The actual word euthanasia means good or happy death. And you see my question mark there. It's legal in Canada, Belgium, Switzerland, Netherlands, Luxembourg, Australia, Colombia, and there are several other countries in the world, but these are the most prominent where it is legal. In our United States, California, Oregon, Hawaii, Washington, Colorado, Maine, Vermont, New Jersey, and the District of Columbia all allow it. Montana has a little bit of a caveat with that, but they have in certain instances also allowed euthanasia or doctor-assisted suicide to proceed. Now, Here's some things that you have to uh, maybe take into consideration. Are we talking about something that is active or passive? Active euthanasia would be that you are doing something to end your life. Whether you do that yourself or through the agency of another, it is nothing more than self-murder, which is the same as suicide. Suicide is a little bit of a separate discussion, uh, given some of the mental state that can factor in. But if I'm actively choosing to end my own life, uh, then I am doing in violation of what God says not to kill, not to murder. Now, all killing, uh, or let me say it in the right order, all murder is killing, but all killing is not murder. I'll hopefully explain that in a moment. Further, when we're talking about this issue, we have to understand whether we're talking about a natural or an unnatural, either process or also continuation of life. And the idea of dying with dignity, uh, people throw that little phrase out all the time. Where did we get it from? It's not in Scripture. Uh, in fact, dying with dignity uh, is uh, even almost a misnomer. Sin entered the world, Romans 5 verse 12, and by sin came death. God is not interested in death. He is the author of life. And so dying with dignity uh, isn't even a proper way to speak, in my opinion, biblically. Now, in this discussion, here's uh, the simple way to condense it down and be very concise. Are we talking about preserving life or prolonging death? Are we talking about preserving life or prolonging death? Again, is this a voluntary measure or a not voluntary measure? That is, am I choosing to do it or is someone else choosing to do it for me? Sometimes that factors in. We'll talk about that in just a moment. Uh, again, the natural versus unnatural idea. Uh, is this something that given just the natural course of events uh, without any intervention that death would be the result? Or is it the case that it's uh, that unnatural means are being used to uh, just prolong death? You're just putting it off, so to speak. Uh, again, we have to be very brief because of our time. Uh, there is a principle of double effect that often uh, is involved in these matters. The principle of double effect says you're intending one thing, but another consequence may result. If you have an individual with a terminal disease and they're in terrible pain, the use of high-powered uh, pain medication may, in fact, in some cases, uh, speed their death. Is that your intent? No. Uh, is that uh, to say that those individuals suffering cannot receive that pain treatment? I do not believe so. The principle of double effect says I'm intending to alleviate their pain, to keep them comfortable. If it accelerates their death, that's not the intended consequence I'm looking for, and I think that would thus be responsible. Now, what we have to realize is the uniqueness of each situation. I can't tell you anything tonight, black and white, to say it's always right, it's always wrong. Every situation has to be uh, taken on its own merits. And when we're talking about this issue, it appears, at least uh, from my study of God's Word, that if I am simply doing something to prolong death, uh, then I can, if I so choose, 
choose to remove that prolonging of death. And usually that's again through unnatural means. If I am artificially keeping an individual from dying, if it is my choice as their family member or even as they themselves, and I just put on here at the bottom, an advanced care directive and a living will is important so you don't have to rely on someone else to make this decision for you. You need to make these decisions in advance and have them in writing so your family will know. If I have an individual with a, a disease for which they cannot recover, if they have suffered an injury uh, for which there is no hope uh, of their life being restored, uh, if there is some unnatural artificial means that is merely prolonging their death, whether that's a respirator, whether that's uh, artificial hydration and nutrition, if I am merely prolonging death and if uh, things were to play out without those elements and death would be the result, then I think that those elements can then thus be taken from them and allow death to occur. Why? Am I murdering that individual? No, I'm not murdering that individual. I'm not killing them. I'm simply allowing uh, their life uh, to end in a natural way. Is this an easy question uh, to wade through? It most certainly is not. It's a very emotionally charged one. Again, the uniqueness of the situation makes it difficult always to know. You know the names, Jack Kevorkian. You might remember the Terry Shivo case. Uh, all of these, again, each one of them has to be considered uh, with their own special, unique circumstances. And so tonight I'm hesitant and I'm not. Uh, hopefully you've not got the impression that I'm saying it's absolutely okay here, it's absolutely not okay there. Um, we would wish and we would pray that none of us would ever be placed in a position where we had to make these choices, but many of you have already. Many will no doubt be going forward. Uh, if you want guidance on that, uh, we'd be happy to help you in that way, again, using God's Word uh, as our guide. But there is a big difference, if you just remember this statement, between preserving life and prolonging death. And they're not the same, and I'd be happy to explore that with you further uh, if needed. Last question tonight, maybe one uh, very ominous to end on. When did God create hell? Uh, I'm kind of the, the old opinion like one preacher. He was asked a series of questions on hell. He said, I don't plan on going there, so I don't want to know any more about it. Well, that's kind of the way I end tonight too. I don't plan on going there. I don't want to know any more about it. When did God create it? Here's my best guess. Second Peter 2 verse 4. Peter said, if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. When did God cast the angels down who sinned? Who were the angels who sinned? When did they sin? How did they sin? Where did they sin? If you answer those questions, then you'll know when he created hell. Same time, it seems, or at least uh, shortly before, perhaps. Uh, the word for hell there is of interest, Second Peter 2, verse 4. Peter uses the word Tartarus, which is the Greek mythological place of torment. Uh, not saying that he's trying to equate Greek mythology with Bible truth, uh, but it's interesting that he uses the same term uh, to maybe make an appeal to those who were influenced by Greek mythology. There is a real place where people in this life for their sins will also be punished, just like those who were false teachers uh, were warned here in 2 Peter 2 about that fate. Tonight, we don't want to go there. We don't want you to go there. Jesus has provided a way of rescue from that terrible place. And here is His plan whereby you can be saved. Most of us have seen it. We know it. We love it. We've obeyed it. Uh, tonight, if you're not among those who have obeyed the gospel, uh, these steps you take in a keeping with what the New Testament teaches. You can have your sins forgiven. You can have a hope of eternal life. And you can escape uh, that place of eternal torment. As a child of God, uh, as we said earlier, maybe you need encouragement tonight. We pray with you for that encouragement. And we'd be glad to uh, assist you in offering strength and help and guidance, counsel in any way we can. Certainly at this time, we also have an opportunity as children of God that if sin is there, we can confess that sin. The Bible says when we confess our sins, our Father is faithful and just to forgive us, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Many questions, many answers from the Word of God. Uh, but the greatest question is whether or not we are living each day in preparation to live with Him eternally. Tonight, if you're not doing that, make that preparation even now as we stand and sing together. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. I will hasten to Him, hasten so.
Respond to the invitation, Brother Charles Parsons would like for us to pray for him. He says he has sinned a lot. Um, he didn't uh, return to the assembly as quickly as he should have, and uh, specifically didn't treat God as good as God treated Charles. So if you will, please bow with me as we pray for Charles. Righteous God and Father in heaven, we are very thankful to you for the blessing that we have as your children and being able to come to you and ask for your forgiveness. Father, we know you, are the, you love us very much. You have given us your all. And we pray, Father, as we strive to know and do your will more better each day, we know that you will bless us in that effort. Father, we come before you now on behalf of our brother Charles Parsons. We love him and we know you love him. And we thank you, Father, for the blessing of brethren. We pray for his forgiveness as he has requested. And indeed, Father, we know that you will. We love you very much. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you're here tonight and have not had the opportunity to partake of the Lord's Supper, if you will make your way to the front pew during the singing of number 495, you will be assisted in doing so. Number 495. <clears throat> Oh, the depth and the riches of God's saving grace Flowing down from the cross for me There the debt for my sins by the Savior was paid In His suffering on Calvary Oh, the depth of such wonderful love Flowing boundless and full and free, and the debt for my sins was all paid in his suffering on Calvary.
Before we dismiss, if you'll stand while we sing number 222. Number 222. <clears throat> after, this we'll have, after this, we'll have our dismissal prayer and then our announcements. <clears throat> Although I cannot see the way or life's impetuous sea, I know that Jesus is my friend and that he'll pilot me. By his hand he'll pilot me over life's impetuous sea. When my blinded eyes can't see, cannot see the Heavenly Father, as we come to the close of this day, we can truly say that it has been good for us to have been here today, to be assembled together with those of like precious faith, those who have obeyed your will, those who are part of your spiritual family, and are blessed to be able to call you our Father, which art in heaven. We thank you, Father, for the time of our study and worship together today. We pray, Father, that all that has been done has brought glory and honor to your high and holy name. We pray, Father, that you'll be with us as we are dismissed from this place this afternoon as we go forth in this week, that we will seize every opportunity that you set before us to be a bright and shining light before others about us. If we have that opportunity to speak to others, Father, give us the understanding and the courage and the love to be able to do so. We pray that you'll be with us throughout the coming week. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.